So we're going, in the lab, we're going to be doing the nutrition lecture. After that, you're going to be dividing and then uh, buddying with your partners and then taking the history. So the bulk of the lab today is going to be the history taking. So it's going to be divided into two, like, you know, let's say like at 10.30 uh, to uh, 11, uh, we're going to be doing the nutrition, 11.10, and then from 11.10 till 1.15, 1 o'clock, we're going to be doing the history. So whatever time you have, it has to be divided, like half of, uh, half of the time, one person is going to gather the history, the other half of the time, the other person is going to gather the history. Am I making sense? Because like you are the patient and you're the nurse. Half of the time you're the patient, half of the time you're the nurse. Does that make sense, guys? All right, so, and then as soon as you collect the history, please, when you go home, I don't know, like, what's the schedule, start typing. And huh? <laughs> Yeah, so start typing because, yeah, when you type tonight, it's going to be more fresh in your head, all right? And then next week, bring the draft, and then if you have any questions, you ask me, and then when you ask your clinical instructors. Okay, so that your paper, when you give it on the 27th is due, right? Is it due the 27th? When is it due? So by the time the paper is due, you have multiple, uh, uh, two, uh, two more weeks to ask questions. So you can fine tune your paper, and then you, by the time you submit it, it's just like a very good copy, so you can in, ensure high 90s as far as grade. Is that clear? So I'm just trying to be helpful and give you leads so that you know, like you have opportunity to ask, in other words. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you ask questions, you're not going to be telling me, oh, I, I printed my paper, or review my paper, and give me feedback. No. You have to ask me, you know, I'm having difficulty here with the nursing diagnosis. How do I write? I wrote it this way. Do you think it's good, or do I have to change it? Does that make sense? So I'm here to give you feedback that way. Is that clear? And then in, in the past, it had been very successful. The, the students like, who came with specific questions, and I elaborated, they fixed it, and then so they got better grade. And it's, it's like, it's up to you guys. You know, I'm here to help, and then if you don't ask, and then later on you find out that you did a mistake, and then you got points off, who, you know, like, you lost the opportunity. Am I making sense, guys? So I'm here to help you, so that you can get high 90s for your paper, okay? So we need a paper copy of it next week for class. Okay, see, like, the key is uh, Barsumian and Harland, they, they put like a folder, you, pu you put it in, like in the, uh, uh, on Canvas. Me and Talin, Keklitian, we, we want hard copy. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah, so that's like, um, you know, like I know how to do it on Canvas because during COVID, obviously, we did everything online, but like it's harder. It takes longer for me, like to have a screen and then type. And then that text box all the time, like I'm having crazy, like uh, goes up, down. Oh, you're not taping me right now. I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I always having difficulty to put that text box to write the notes, and then I have to kind of put it in a way that it doesn't cover the 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 the, the, the text. So for instance, like I really love to sit down and do it with the pencil and then eraser, still old fashioned. I feel myself more professor that way. <laughs> so I have to leave my moral up too, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I hope it's not too much of an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. All right, so so for that reason, like you know, Tallinn and me, I want we want the uh, paper copy. And then so we, to to follow the APA, you have to print only single page. Does that make sense? Not uh, front and back, you know, like as much as I'm thrifty and I'm also cautious about like not wasting paper, but like it's not my rule, APA is like single page. Is that clear, guys? And then so the, the grading rubric has to be attached also. Is that clear? Okay. All right, very good. Okay, all right, so anyway, I'm, with, I'm very thankful to Christy to take the initiation of taping because it's, a, it's like a, a specialty itself to record <laughs> okay, so we're going to be doing the pain today, and then so um, you have to tell me now. Oh, it. did you plug it in? Oh, this needs to be plugged into the USB. Okay. Thank you. 
screen. Uh, okay, that's okay. Try and the next time we'll do it. Huh? Okay, thank you for the yeah. help. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. I mean, yeah. thank you. We'll try it afterwards. Okay. Okay, guys. You know why we're going to be doing pain today? Like, what does pain to do with the uh, history and physical physical examination? What does pain have to do? But it has a lot to do, you know why? Because like when you're taking the history and if the patient is in pain, like how are they gonna be, what kind of uh, morale are they gonna be in to give you all this history? Does that make sense? Oh, you know, like, uh, like I'm in pain and you're asking me questions. Mm -hmm. So obviously we have to be considered about, uh, considerate about their um, comfort level uh, so that they can give you the history. So that's why we're gonna be going over the pain. Is that clear? All right, the same thing when we're doing the mental status, like what has mental status to do with physical examination? Obviously, when you're taking the history and somebody has Alzheimer's, like how, how are you gonna be getting the history? Does that make sense? So in other words, mentally, they have to be lucid to give you the history. Otherwise, if mentally they're not lucid, they can tell you things, but like, is that gonna be helpful? Is that clear? And then um, one other thing that I'm gonna be bringing it up, so when you are, uh, gathering the history. So last week I said it like somebody comes with a chief complaint, right? So I have headache times two days, right? So what was that? The chief complaint. What is the chief complaint? The problem. The problem that they came. So obviously people, when they have a problem at home, they try to do something. Nobody wants to come to the hospital. It's not like an inviting place. Do you agree? Yeah. Right? So they do something at home because they want to stay home. Do you agree? And then so like, but like, the, but like they do something, it's not helping. Then they say, okay, like, let me go. Because like whatever I did, it's not helping me. So let me go, right? So for that reason, they run and come to the hospital or the clinic and then they're asking for help, right? So that's the problem that is driving them to the yeah. hospital. So for that reason, like, you know, like they can have like a stomach pain and then they're having nausea also. And then so, but like one of them is the real reason for them to come to the hospital. For that reason, the chief complaint has to include the thing, the symptom that really brought them to the hospital. Am I making sense, guys? So don't write a lot of uh, story on the, chief, uh, on the chief complaint. I have stomach pain, all right? So don't write that, oh, they had nausea also. They felt like vomiting. Where are you gonna be writing that in the HPI? Am I making sense? So like the chief complaint has to be as concise as possible. And then so like it really needs to reflect the real problem that they drove and came to the hospital. Am I making sense, guys? All right, so now, last time I said, all right, so okay, there is like one little sentence that is indi indicating the problem. But like you need to know more about that problem. So what did you do? You're gonna be asking question. And then what mnemonic you used? Old card. Old card. Old card. Why did you use the old card? Because it's a reference. Is it engraved on the stone? No. no. All uh, the, do all the words like the onset, location, duration? Do they need to have an answer? Not necessarily. Is that clear? You're only using the old card so that you're not going to be forgetting things. Is that clear? All right. So before before you even start the old card, I forgot to tell you this last time. Open your ears. You have to establish reliability of this patient. Okay, okay, open your ears. What are you gonna establish? The reliability of this patient. It's on the, um, on the sample paper. You're gonna say that, you know, history obtained from the patient. Patient seems to be a reliable historian. <laughs> Is this clear? Every paper has to include this, guys, all right? So, history obtained from the patient it's on the sample paper. History obtained from the patient. The patient seems, seems to be a reliable historian. Why are we saying seems to be a reliable historian? Because you really don't have like a big intensive questionnaire that you ask and the score the mental status of the patient. Am I making sense? You ask like, what's your name? Oh, where do you live? Okay, where are we? Okay, so I asked all these three questions, so like I kind of established reliability of? Rosanna, Susanna, Susanna. Okay, Susanna, do you see? So what did I ask? Like three questions, her name, where does she live? I mean, obviously, that one I wouldn't have known because I don't know where you live. You could have said anything, right? Am I making sense? 
So, all right, so, but I, if I, I, I can check you on my roster, I know who you are, and so I have something to, to check, you have to verify, and eventually I'm gonna know your name, right? Okay, so, so I can check the name, and then uh, you said that we are in Norfolk, I know we are in Norfolk, but she said that oh, they live in Norfolk, how do I know? I, unless if I have her driver's license, I won't know. Does that make sense? So in other words, you have to ask a question that you know the answer also. So you know where you are, where, what is today? Thursday. Yeah, okay. So that one I know also, kind of, I can check the reliability. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense, guys? So the, I'm checking the reliability by asking simple questions that I know the answer also. And then, so what did I say? The patient seems to be a reliable historian because like only for with three questions, you know, I cannot validate, like I, I cannot put a final seal that my patient is like totally lucid or totally mentally functioning, but I know that like, she's not intoxicated and she doesn't have Alzheimer's. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. So otherwise, if I don't use the word seems, like if I use a, a questionnaire that it needs a scoring, that's more intense. So then I will say that I use mini mental status questionnaire and she scored 30 over 30. <coughs> Am I making sense, guys? Mm -hmm. So we don't have time to do the mini mental status questionnaire. We're just asking a few questions to establish the reliability of the patient. And so what do I write? The history obtained from the patient, the patient seems to be a reliable historian. Okay. Am I making sense? Okay, very good. Do we put that in our chief complaint? Or where no, does that go? it's like right uh, after the, right after. After old cart or before old cart? Before. Where did I put it in the sample? You said before old cart. Before cut okay. them. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay so, uh, look on the sample paper where I put it. Okay. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So every paper has to include that. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you agree? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise, if we didn't establish the reliability of patient, we're wasting our time. Is that clear? Okay, very good. So same thing is like when the patient has pain, so we have to be more considerate about the patient because somebody who is in pain, they're gonna be impatient and they're not gonna be giving like a whole total history. Okay, so, all right. So assessment of pain, it is entirely subjective. So whatever the patient says, we have to uh, accept it. All right, so now in other words, so uh, somebody can have a paper cut. I know paper cut hurts. But that if somebody's like really crying about the paper cut and then saying that 10 over 10, I have pain, and then you, ha you, think, you think in your head that, you know, it shouldn't be hurting this much, that you only say it in your head. You cannot say it to the patient. If the patient says, like, my pain is 10 over 10, we have to accept it. Is that clear? So there, is, there shouldn't be any judgment. It's totally subjective, and it has to be accepted as the patient expresses. Okay, all right, so it's unique for each individual. It's unpleasant symptoms, obviously. Nobody likes to have pain. And it's the fifth vital sign. Okay, why is it the fifth vital sign? All right, so who came and said it, that it has to be the fifth vital sign? The Joint Commission, all right? So the Joint Commission, who is Joint Commission? The Joint Commission is like a body. It's an organization. It's an institution. The Joint Commission, you're going to be hearing it, like because every hospital that you're going to be working, they're certified by the Joint Commission. Is that clear? Why the hospitals go through the Joint Commission, get the certification? Accreditation, it's like the word is accreditation. Why? Do they love the Joint Commission? Really, they're not, nobody loves the Joint Commission <laughs> because like, they come with the strict standards. They give you like three days, like they have all this big book with like uh, questionnaires, 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 bring me this, bring me this, bring me this, and we're gonna review it. So nobody likes that surveying process. It's like very tedious, right? But we don't have much choice. Every hospital that you're gonna be working, they have to be accredited by the Joint Commission. Why? Reimbursement. <laughs> because if the hospital is not accredited by the Joint Commission, Medicare doesn't reimburse that hospital. So the hospital loses big business. Am I making sense? So because like a, a big chunk of our consumers are the elderly, and then the elderly uh, 65 and above, they get the Medicare. And if the Medicare is gonna be paying the hospital for services, the hospital has to say that I am Joint Commission certified or accredited. Otherwise, the Medicare doesn't send money. So like the hospitals, they don't have much choice. They don't wanna lose that business. Is that clear? So for, for that reason, all of us, are 
under that big pressure that like we have to perform, excel in our performance because nobody wants to fail the accreditation. Like it's very tedious process. It, it's very painful. Does that make sense? <laughs> but like the, whether we like it or not, that's, that's life. We have to abide with the standards that the Joint Commission requires us to put. Okay, now the Joint Commission puts a standards. What are the standards? Rules, guidelines. You have to follow, you have to follow, you have to follow because we're coming in three years and we're gonna check whether did you follow or not, right? So so like we're always, okay, like we're gonna learn and then, okay, always in the hospitals we do mock surveys, mock surveys because like we have to get prepared in case the real one comes, what are we gonna be answering, right? Okay, so when they put a standard, they don't come sit down and then kind of, oh, let's write the standards. And then so like we can require from the hospitals to follow. No, their standards have to be based on science, on evidence, all right? So their standards have to be based on science, all right? So they cannot come with the standards that, oh, just for out of pleasure, they're asking us to follow. So they have to come with a standards that is based on science and then they put this new rules and then we have to follow and then we have to be surveyed in the coming three years. Is that clear, guys? Now, so now the Joint Commission comes and says that nurses have to assess the patient's pain level. Even if the patient comes to you and says, oh, I have a pimple, I have a pimple, it's hurting me. Oh, like pimple is hurting me. Or, 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 like, or my head is the, my, I'm, uh, my head is falling, my head is falling, I'm combing my hair and then my head is falling. There is not, there, the patient is not even coming with a complaint of pain. The patient is coming because the head is falling, right? The nurse has to ask, are you in pain? Am I making sense? So, in other words, every time the patient comes to you with anything, anything, okay, hair falling, hair, or they're coming with, for breast self or a clinical breast exam, right? Or, Nothing to do with pain, but still you have to ask if you, have in, you are in pain or not. Okay, so like we have to assess the pain level even if the patient is not complaining. Am I making sense? So for that reason, what did, the, what is, what did we decide? We decided that, okay, every time we're doing the vital signs, let's ask the pain. So we won't forget. So like the vital signs will condition us, will prompt us to ask for the pain level. Is that clear? So for that reason, it became the fifth vital sign. So that way, we know that it is being documented, all right? And then we're keeping a trend, okay? So now, why did the Joint Commission came up and said that nurses have to ask about the pain level of the patients? What did I say? Why do you put the standard? The standard is based on science. science. So what did the science say? What, what did the science say? Who has pain? Who, ha who gets pain? Yeah, all of us get pain, but like, what is it a result of when we go back to the science? Tissue injury, tissue injury. So for that reason, so in other words, like we're kind of digging, digging, are you in pain, are you in pain? Okay, and then you say, oh, I am in pain. So automatically, what am I gonna think? Oh, there, there, there might be a tissue injury that this patient is suffering from, but that like, she's not being expressive. She comes like because her hair is falling, but like there is like another tissue injury another part of the body that is causing pain, but like, uh, she hasn't, that's not her priority at this point. But as a nurse, like, I'm digging for it so I can help her. Does that make, does that make sense, guys? All right, so for that reason, the science said that pain is a uh, result, most of the time, uh, part of a tissue injury, so for that reason, we are kind of digging to find out, and then so we can, um, give prompt uh, treatment so that patient can be alleviated of pain. I think I said this. I think I said this. Okay, all right, so now this is like, okay, so now uh, then we came and said, okay, how are we gonna be documenting about the pain? All right, so because people, some people, um, they know a lot of words and then they can be very eloquent describing their pain. Another person doesn't have all that vocabulary, but not necessarily can be expressive using the right words to express about her pain or his pain. So for that reason, like what did we need to have? Like a tool that it can quantify the pain. Is that clear? Every time when you're asking about pain, what are you gonna be writing? 
0 over 10, 1 over 10, 2 over 10. Is that clear? So because that becomes a common language among, among the healthcare professional community, at the same time, it's easy to communicate with the patient. Am I making sense? Okay, so this tool was kind of driven a long time ago. So like in the uh, Whaley on Wong, they were the pediatric masters prepared nurses. Like I kind of, when I was in school, I had their uh, textbook. And so when they were writing their pediatric book, they came up with the pain rating scale with the faces because they knew that the children, they don't have the vocabulary to be expressive about their pain, right? So, and then, uh, so they, the kids, they're familiar with happy faces because they have stickers, right? So like they can relate to the happy faces. So they can be more expressive. They pinpointing, okay, where am I as far as my pain? Then like, you know, eventually the adult community adopted this tool also because it's easier to communicate because like in the adult community, what do we have? We have language barrier also, right? So in other words, like if it's with pictures, any person can kind of pinpoint to say like, where am I with my pain level? Am I making sense, guys? So you're gonna be seeing these faces in intake forms, all right? So have you seen it? Like in intake forms, it's very common. And then so like at Glendale Adventist, we did like this uh, flashcards and we laminated it, we put it on the ring. And then so like with every language, so like here, here you can see all the languages, all right? So that, you know, like at least like, the, when you're asking where are you with your pain level, they can pinpoint it and then there is the verb, uh, not the verb, the word. And so accordingly, you can assess the patient uh, pain level. And then so like if there is pain, so what are we gonna do? Intervention. What is intervention? We have to do something about it. Is that clear? So the intervention is, it can be pharmaceutical, it can be non-pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical is medication, non-pharmaceutical is comfort, like, you know, like elevate the arm, massage, you know, some positioning, all right? So anything that you're gonna do to provide comfort to the patient, is that clear? Okay, so once you do the intervention, what are you anticipated to do? Follow up, follow up. Don't do intervention without follow-up, all right? So follow-up is needed. Is that clear, guys? So you can't give the Tylenol and forget about that patient. Half an hour later, you have to ask, come and ask, all right, so I gave you the Tylenol, and then how do you feel now? You think like the Tylenol was effective. So you have to assess as a nurse because the doctor can give you like opioids and then still the patient is in pain. So it doesn't mean that, oh, okay, you're getting the pain. So like, okay, you need to get alleviated of pain. No, you don't know like the extent of the injury that the patient is suffering from. So you have to be the advocate of the patient in other words. Does that make sense? And then so uh, like, and also please, please inquire. One time like I'm on the unit at Adventist and so because like I do the diabetes education, like, you know, like I go upstairs and I'm in the nurse's station, I'm writing. Uh, the doctor comes and then asks the nurse, okay, so like how is the pain level of uh, the patient? And then she turns and she says, you know, I didn't assess this because, you know, I don't speak her language. So that's not an answer. That's not an answer. All right, so like you just cannot give the medication and then cannot come and then reassess because you had the language barrier. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So you have to find someone to translate or you have to find the means that like computerized translator. I mean, I know it's like, it's, it's a hassle that one, but at least like in the unit, there is a nurse that speaks that person's language and then, that's, that doesn't carry too much of a, 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 a burden to ask, like, how are you doing, like, after this medication? Am I making sense, guys? All right, so, you know, so the key is, and this is not on the slide, and this is not also on the test, but, like, like let me tell you this. Hi. Hi. Are you Wendy? Yeah. Okay, the class starts at 8. Did I know. Okay, all right, go ahead and uh, sit there, please. All right, so we'll talk afterwards, okay? Sure. So this is the class that you're gonna be with, all right? Okay. No worries, thank okay. you. All right, you can sit there, okay. All right, guys, this is not on the test, and then this is not on the slides, and I'm just gonna give you an overall idea so that you can understand. Okay, so the WHO, WHO is World Health Organization, all right, so Europe follows WHO, all right, so like mainly because that's the, 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 those guidelines are more specific with the practice in Europe. All right, so what does WHO say? It's like we have three letters, three letters, okay? So like there are three letters. So that there is pain here, 
Okay, so there is pain here, and then there is pain here, right? Okay, so now, so if I have headache, and I'm okay, so it's pain. All right, so what do I do? I go and then get over-the-counter medication. What do I get? Tylenol, all right, Tylenol, Advil, all right? So, so these are over-the-counter medications, right? So they're not non-opioids. Is that clear? So there's this pain, love pain is like tolerable, it's headache, I'm gonna be, or menstrual pain. Like you don't go to the hospital because you have menstrual pain. It's part of the process, right? So you take one of these medications, right? Okay, so now, so that's, that's this pain is non-opioid. It means you can treat yourself. So now, then there is like, you know, you had a surgery, like there is an incision line, so it's hurting more, right? So this cannot help. So for a reason, like you're prescribed Tylenol with codeine. So like there is some kind of an opioid added with the analgesics. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is like analgesic plus opioid, okay? So so that you're, you're given numbered medication. You're not given like a whole box, all right? So because like you're healing, you're during the healing process, you're going through pain, and then so the provider doesn't want you to get excru excruciating pain, and so for there is an analgesic plus opioid. Is that clear, guys? All right, so then, so there is a pain here, you know, so it can be like cancer pain, it can be some kind of a pain that like these medications are not gonna be helpful. So you're gonna be on IV opioid, all right? So IV opioid, okay, so, or like uh, I am opioid, or whatever, IV opioid, okay, so opioids, okay. So this is, so in other words, if somebody has cancer and then they're, pain, they're, they're kind of crying with pain, we're not gonna say, okay, let's start with Tylenols, let's see how the pain level is gonna go. We know that the Tylenol is not gonna do anything. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. So then you don't go like, oh, Tylenol plus opioid. Oh, then now like, we're gonna go to opioid. No, this person is already, it shows there is a diagnosis that like that pain is very excruciating. So these are not gonna be helpful. You start from here. Am I making sense, guys? So this is like, when the doctors go to school, this is what they learn. All right, so sometimes, sometimes you're gonna be having a patient that like they're here, they can be like on IV opioid, like drip, but still they're in pain, right? So, and then like you're gonna be advocate for this patient and say, doctor, really, like I'm following your regimen, still this patient is crying, what can we do? Every hospital, it's a rule, every hospital, they have pain specialists. Is that clear? Every hospital, like we had one at Glendale Adventist, now we have two, so obviously they, the, need, the, the need is more. So you have to say, doctor, doctor, do you want me to put a request for pain specialist to come and assess this patient? Is that clear, guys? Why? Because pain specialists, that's their specialty. They're usually anesthesiologists, and then they went back to school and learned more, and then they can give pain medication they, they, that they feel comfortable doing so beyond label. All right, and then, but like they're comfortable of doing it. So in other words, like for that reason, like you're, the doctor doesn't know like how the patient is crying because you are with the patient. So, you know, like he, he only listens to you or she only listens to you because like you are interacting with the patient. So please be advocate of the patient, let them not cry. All right, so like, well, let's ask for the pain specialist to come and then assess the patient and put another order. And then usually when the pain specialist writes the order, the primary care physician feels comfortable following his recommendations. Is this clear, guys? How do we prevent opioid dependence on people who are in like that top level of pain? You know, like there is a lot of time we are afraid of giving medication because they're gonna be dependence. Dependence and addiction, they're two different things, you know? So dependence is like, okay, I need it. Addicted, you know, like I can't live without it, right? So, but on the other hand, like, you know, let, let the pain specialist assess, okay? okay. Yeah, all right, guys, okay, so, um, and then one thing, like this is, this is from my experience, you know, so, and then plus, like, please, like this pain is very, how is how do I say this sensitive one time like you know like uh, I'm working at St. Joe's in Burbank you know so I have this patient we had uh, terminal patients coming also um, and then he's on opioid like drip and then we have to morphine drip and then so like we have to assess the respiration because morphine um, drops the respiration we want to control the pain but like we're, we're not going to be Oh, making them stop breathing either, right? So, and then, so like I come, I, I and then knock the door, and then I'm being like a nice nurse. So I, I know how you feel, and she, stop, stop. Do you have bone cancer? I said, no. Then he said, then you don't know how I feel. So from now on, 
so don't say how you, I know how you feel. You don't know how you feel. So like it was like a, a lesson for me. You know, I didn't mean to uh, be uh, insensitive, but I thought I was being polite, but like it wasn't polite, right? So for that reason, what are you gonna say? I don't know how you feel because I have not gone through bone cancer, but I am here to help you like in the upcoming 12 hours to, prov to provide you comfort and listen to you and be your advocate. That one you're gonna be doing. Is that clear, guys? So like I learned the hard way, you know, like it was very, uh, and then shocking for me, but, but I was young, G Glenn, uh, I was at uh, St. Joseph in Burbank. So uh, and anyway, so from that time on, I never say, you know, I know how you feel because you don't know how they feel because everybody has their own struggles that they're going through then you don't know. All right, but like the only thing you can provide is the comfort and then the resource and then being advocate for the patient. Is that clear, guys? Yeah, all right. So, and then, uh, yeah, so there is acute pain and then there is a chronic pain. So what is acute pain? So let's, let's say we're running right now, okay? So like for exercise and then I trip and then I fall. So what happens? Like, okay, so there is all this laceration on my knee, right? And then so, and so I obviously I'm not happy, right? So like my, the, the palm is lacerated also. So I have to go and then wash it. And then so like, okay, so I'm gonna be in pain because there is a tissue injury, right? So like what happened? Like, you know, I fell and then so the, it, it scrubbed my skin. There is some blood and then there are some pebbles right? So like I have to wash it and then so I have to treat it also. Then what do I do? What do I need to take medication? Yes, we should. You know why? Okay. So every time this one is on the test, all right? So it's not on the slide. So you have to know this. All right. So, so every time like there is a tissue injury, all right? So there is a tissue injury. Okay. So we have COX-1, COX-1, and then we have COX-2. This is like a long name. I give the test, I have written the long name also, but this is the short name, all right? So these are like two, uh, so these are like in our system, they're circulating, all right? So as soon as, okay, so this COX-1 has a job, like, all right, so what is the job? Okay, protecting the lining of the stomach and kidney. All right, all right, so now the COX-2 does not have a job. Okay, so this is the job. What is the job? What is the job of COX-2 does not have a job. Is that clear, guys? All right, so we, this is like now, like in our system, we have a COX-1, what is it doing? It's protecting the lining of our stomach and the lining of the feet. All right, so, and then COX-2, there is not, it, there, it doesn't do anything. Now, as soon as there is injury, and I'm like, I, I tripped, right? So like, I mean, I'm injured, my knees and then my palms, all right? So as soon as the injury happens, so these two are activated. Okay, activated with injury. Are you with me, guys? All right, so uh, they're activated with the injury, and so what do they do? Okay, so they activate arachidonic acid. All right, so they activate the arachidonic acid, and then so, and then our kidneys. Okay, the kidneys secrete prostaglandins. All right, so as a result, the kidney, the kidney secretes prostaglandins. Are you with me, guys? Yeah. So the acridonic acid um, stimulates the kidneys to, 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 the, to do the prostaglandins. So prostaglandins come from the kidney. Okay. Is that clear, guys? As soon as the prostaglandins are out, inflammatory process starts. All right. So inflammatory process starts now. Inflammatory process. So inflammatory process starts. So what is inflammatory process? What is the what are the signs? Okay, let's start one by one. So first, what happens first? Red, heat, redness, heat. All right. So now when you have red and heat, there is a fire, right? 
So what, 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 what do you need to do? You need to extinguish the fire, right? So what happens now? There is going to be water. The body sends all the water there to extinguish. So what do you get there? Swelling. Okay, swelling. Do you see now how it happens? The swelling. And then so what do you think the whole process is? Painful, right? Painful. Okay, guys. So one way, this is a good thing. Because like when I am doing like deep cleaning, I'm always doing deep cleaning. So like that's my exercise. You know, like I'm, if you leave me like in my house, like 24 hours, I'm never bored because I'm always cleaning <laughs> and redecorating. You know, like I'm never bored and I'm always active. And then the next day I wake up and then I see like a bruise here, bruise here. Why? Because like I hit myself carrying all these things. It gives me so much, like every time I'm cleaning, I'm feeling so good. Right? Okay. So, then, so the next day I wake up and then I see bruises here and there, right? So like the, the day before, I didn't even know that I did it. But like what is my body telling me? You hurt yourself, right? So in other words, this is good because like the body is communicating with us. Does that make sense, guys? It's not that bad, all right? Because like we're not in the vacuum and then like standing up like this. We're always doing things and then we might be hurting ourselves. So the body communicates with us. So this is a good thing. So then I have to take some kind of an alley the next day or Advil, right? So to treat that inflammatory process. Am I making sense? So now, so it's obviously painful, right? So it's obviously painful. So now nobody likes pain and nobody likes the inflammatory process because like we have to kind of tell this inflammatory process, okay, like subside. All right, so yeah, okay, you, you gave me message, but now I'm gonna let you subside because I don't want like my body to be in fire. Am I making sense, guys? So now I don't want the pain. I don't want the pain. I don't want the pain. If I don't want the pain, so I don't want the inflammatory process to happen, right? So I don't want the prostaglandin. Are you with me? I don't want the prostaglandin, then I don't want the arachidonic acid, right? If I don't want the arachidonic acid, I don't want this to be activated, right? So what are we gonna get? We're gonna get non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory medications. What are they? NSAIDs, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so NSAIDs. So I, I go ahead and take the NSAID because I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and then I don't want I don't want I don't want the COX-1 to be activated. So what do I take? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, <laughs> right? Who are they? Ibuprofen. Oh, okay, so you have ibuprofen or an Advil. Motrin, Aleve, Naprosyn. Okay. All this, uh, all these medications that you take for over the counter, so they are NSAIDs, they're deactivating what? The COX-1, they're working on COX-1. Is that clear? All right, so this way, kind of, all right, so obviously COX-2 is still activated, so for that is a little by little, the inflammatory process gets subsided. Is that clear, guys? So there is only, uh, ah, for that reason with the NSAID, what do you take? What was the role of the COX-1? Protecting the lining of the stomach. Now like you know, you deactivated COX-1. So what happens to the lining of the stomach? Who protects? No one, nobody. So for that reason, what do you do with the NSAID? You don't take it with food. Take it with food. food. Because what is the food gonna do? It's like the food is kind of, it makes a paste and it comes and then covers the lining of the stomach so that you know like nobody irritates the lining of the stomach. Is that clear, guys? You know, like when I was working at Partner Memorial Hospital, like when I was having my menstruation, and then my, uh, there is a, there is a, the, the pharmacy is like decentralized. There is a pharmacist on the unit. I said, you know, I, I don't remember her name. Like she was my friend also. Like, okay, can you hand, can you give me two Advil? Because like I'm having really menstrual pain. And I, I forgot that I was hungry. Oh, and then I took it. Have you taken it without food? Like you feel like, you know, the stomach is kind of somebody's like taking it and then uh, squeezing it so bad. Like, you know, am I thinking the stomach pain or the menstrual pain? <laughs> like, you know, so it's that bad. So in other words, like it's, it's really you have to take it with food. So you, you, so you know, we don't know the value of the COX-1 till you take the NSAID without food. Does that make sense? Uh, you know, so I, I took it by accident without knowing, but like it was an experience that I can never forget. Um, since the COX-1 also protects the lining of the kidney, does, I know like uh, NSAID use, um, like frequent NSAID use also affects the kidneys. Kidney, for that reason, yeah, so that, you know, a, they, they can have blood 
Oh. Yeah, so yeah, it, the, during for the elderly, even for the elderly, you know, you don't know them, don't give them Advil. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, because you never know, you know, you don't, you don't say that, uh, yeah, when you do, oh, the, your neighbor comes and says, oh, I have a pain, I mean, you're like, I'm 80 years old, oh, take Advil. You don't know the history. Mm -hmm. Now, like, you go now that she's going to have hematuria, mm -hmm. right? So for reason, like, no, you know, the, the, I know Advil is, like, over the counter, but, like, I don't know your history, I'm sorry. But like you know, I cannot be helpful because like I can damage you more. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So COX two doesn't have a job, but it is also activated. Yes. And so yes. Both of them yes. Have. Yeah. So when you take the NSAID, what are you doing? You're fifty percent. You're controlling the activation. In other words, still it's good. For because the inflammatory process subsides over time. It's not in one day. You can see that little by little it goes away, right? And so for that reason, there is only one medication that works on COX two. Who is it? Who? Isn't it Celebrex? Yeah, Celebrex, very good. So Celebrex, Celebrex is only medication that works on COX-2, but it's not over the counter, it's like with med, uh, with prescription, What's is that called? clear? Celebrex, Celebrex, Celebrex. 1998, it was like the most uh, uh, used uh, medication, you know, like everybody was going into Celebrex, why? Because it, it doesn't have GI effect, and then guess what happened? You know, so that now it's causing cardiac ischemia. All oh. mm. oh, right, so for that reason, like a block box. Okay, so like we went back into Advil, morphine, you know, the cheap one, right? So in other words, uh, but that, but still, rheumatologists climb I mean, and then orthopedic still use it, use it uh, with caution, obviously. Is that clear, guys? Mm. So it's it's still in the market, right? Okay, yeah. Should we know that that drug, Celebrex? Celebrex, yeah, it's only one drug. <laughs> it's only one drug, Cox two. It's only one drug. You can learn Celebrex. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, what is chronic pain? A chronic pain is obviously chronic. Mm -hmm. So, what is chronic? At least like three months. What does it say here? So it's kind of it, the pain is persisting even with medication. All right, so it's not going away. Probably what happens is that the medication is subsiding, but it doesn't resolve it altogether. Is that clear, guys? Give me an example. Uh, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. Okay, very good. Yeah, it's chronic. I mean, it's it's controlled with medication, but it doesn't uh, disappear, right? And then so what else? Okay, so I'm. Huh? Shingles, shingles, good. Shingles, okay, so for that reason, like, you know, the the virus sleeps, but still the pain is there. All right, so what else? Arthritis. Lupus, okay, very good, what else? Arthritis. Arthritis, okay, yeah, because it depends on like, how bad it is the cartilage is worn out. And then, so, diabetic neuropathy. What have you heard about diabetic neuropathy? That it feels like, like uh, stinging or poking. Yeah, so always like, you know, this is this is always gonna happen to you guys. So in the morning you come, and then so you're doing your round, right? Like, okay, six, yeah. seven o'clock, you're doing your round, and then so, oh, what, what's your name? Valeria. Valeria? Valeria. Valeria, okay, so you say, how did you sleep yesterday night? And this is in the morning, like, I'm, the, I'm your nurse. What do you say? I, the I whole night? Like, the whole night I had, like, stabbing pain. And then, and then you say like, what, what, what's happening, why? Okay, so because if she has diabetes uncontrolled, that's what they're gonna complain. So this is not uncommon. Every morning that you're gonna be seeing a diabetic patient, they're gonna say the whole night I couldn't sleep because I was having burning, tingling, and as if somebody is coming and then the needle is like pricking, 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 pricking. my whole soul is prick. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. And then you wonder like, okay, what's happening? That's diabetic neuropathy. Is that clear? So it's not unusual you're going to hear this all the time because you're going to be seeing a lot of diabetic patients, obviously, right? Okay, so now what is, what is the medication? Susanna, you said now the symptom. So what is the medication for this? So we're not going to be letting the next day the patient complain of needle, 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 right? So we have to do something for this patient. What medication do you give? Gabapentin. Very good, gabapentin. So what is gabapentin? It's a neuro, it's a neuro, it's a neuro block. Pain. When you do the classification, it is anticonvulsive. It's anticonvulsive. Uh, okay, anticonvulsive. Okay, let me explain why what what happens. All right. So with the diabetic neuropathy. So what happens that? Okay. So this is this is this is our 
the spinal cord and this is our brain, right? So the brain and the spinal cord together. So what do they make? Oh, what do they make? The spinal cord and the brain together, they make central nervous system, all right? So what is central nervous system? Central nervous system is the spinal cord and the brain together. Is that clear, guys? All right, so always remember that, you know, so this is like the spinal cord, it's two-way stream. All right, so what does that mean? It means that like one is sensory, all right, so the other one is motor, all right? Motor, all right, so the, the one is sensory, the other one is motor. It's like a two-way highway, is that clear? So one is gonna sensory, where, the, where does it go? To the brain. It goes up, it goes up, 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 up. The arrow is up, up. Okay, so it takes the messages from the environment, from the environment, carries it to the brain. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. All right, so this is like one way. Where does it go? Up. It's ascending pathway. It goes up. All right, so where does it go? It has to enter into an organ. Which organ does it enter? Brain. Brain. Is that clear, guys? Mm -hmm. So sensory pathway, what does it do? It carries messages from where? Environment. environment. Let me hear it. Environment. environment. So it connects us with the environment. Is that clear, guys? So it carries the messages from the environment, and where does it go? To the brain. Up, 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 and into, enters into where? To the brain. To the brain. So the organ that it enters is the brain. Is that clear, guys? Mm -hmm. So for that reason, it's an afferent. <coughs> What is afferent? It's an English word. It's afferent is means that like you go into an organ. Am I making sense? So sensory is a pathway that takes messages and it enters into an organ. Am I making sense, guys? So now, what does the brain gonna do? What's the role of the brain? What is the role of our brain? Processes it, right? So it, it, it needs to translate because we need our brain to, to make decisions, to come to conclusions. Does that make sense? So in other words, this brain is kind of analyzing it and it's gonna give us a response and then accordingly we're gonna respond to it. Am I making sense? So now the brain is gonna say something and then the message is gonna come out of the brain, right? So what is this? It's efferent pathway. Efferent, what does efferent mean? It's exiting an organ. Is that clear, guys? This is English word, it's not medical word. Efferent is going into an organ, efferent is coming out of an organ. So how do you remember afferent is ascending, it's going up to go into the brain, efferent is exit, EE. -E. Does that make sense, guys? So now it's coming out of the brain. When it comes out of the brain, what does it have? A message, a message that we have to follow, right? Okay, so now this message is gonna come from the brain down. What is the pathway we're using? Motor. Motor pathway. So motor pathway goes to the muscle, okay, and then the muscle moves. Is that clear, guys? So remember, so the brain translates, motor pathway is M, goes to the muscle is M, moves is M. So M, M, M. Is that clear? So if you're gonna be seeing any movement, who does that movement? The muscle does it. Is that clear? Which nerve comes and touches the muscle? Motor nerve, so that we're gonna be moving. Is that clear? Now, what happens in diabetic neuropathy? All right, so what happens that the high blood sugars, they damage the sensory pathway. Damage the sensory pathway. Is that clear? So for that reason, we hear it, foot care, foot care, foot care with diabetic patients. Why? Because like they can injure their foot, they don't feel it. So what is the role of the nurse? Always inspecting. Because like the patient is not gonna say, nurse, nurse, my foot is hurting, come. They don't feel it because the sensory pathway is not working. It's damaged because of high blood sugars. Does that make sense? So for reason that we're using our eyes and our touch to assess the foot. Is that clear? So you have heard it, right? So they can step on a nail, they don't feel it, then they have a gangrene, then, then they have amputation. It's like you don't have to be a nurse to hear this. You have heard it, right? Okay, so why? because their sensory nerves are damaged because of the high blood sugar, they can prick their foot, they don't feel it because this message doesn't go to the brain. If the brain doesn't get the message, it doesn't translate, and you don't feel. Am I making sense? So now what happens? That this brain is sitting, sitting, sitting the whole day. Okay, nobody's bringing any message to the brain. Am I making sense? Because these are all 
not working. So like at night, the brain says, you know, like I have to work. Like what happened? Like the whole day, I didn't get any messages to translate. What's going on, right? So now it says, okay, I'm gonna be sending messages anyway, even though I didn't get any message to translate. Am I making sense? So what happens? All these impulses come from the motor pathway. Where are they going? To the muscle, to the muscle, to the muscle, to the muscle. Every message comes to the muscle. Susanna, how is the patient gonna feel? Needle. Oh, the stabbing. Yeah, uh, yeah, the needle, needle. So every message comes to the muscle, then I feel needle. Or I, the, another message comes to the muscle, I feel needle. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. So for that reason, in the morning when they're complaining about needle, it's not lie. They are complaining about needle pain. Is that clear? So what are we giving gabapentin? What is gabapentin? Gabapentin is anticonvulsive. What is it doing? Like you know, it's saying that don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Does that make sense? So like it's kind of sleeping, uh, making this impulses sleep, and then don't go. Because if you don't go and you don't touch the muscle, the muscle is not going to be feeling that needle pain. Is that clear? So for that reason, it's very important that like you know, gabapentin is given. Otherwise, they're going to be miserable every night. Okay, so. Okay, guys, now, so that's chronic pain. We talked about it, so what is it? Ah, so, uh, all right, so I think this is, this is self-explanatory, right? Okay, and... Um, Professor? Yeah. You said the um, hyperglycemia, it affects the... Sensory pathway. Efferent, or the afferent? Afferent, yeah, afferent, ascending. Remember ascending, because sensory takes it to the brain. It's afferent. Okay, efferent is exit, okay? Um, or I think this is, this is all self-explanatory, all right? So, um, ah, infants, all right, so infants, do they feel pain? Yeah, because you see babies, like when they go for their immunizations, they're crying, huh? All right, so because they feel it, all right, so. Okay, so pregnant women, do they feel it? Yeah, okay. All right, so, okay, pregnant women. Okay, so we're not gonna go too much here because you're gonna learn it in, um, in where? In obstetrics, you learn it. And so, plus, uh, that's not my specialty. Okay, okay, so, okay, it got recorded again, so. <laughs> but, but, and there is nobody who can be a specialty in everything, you know, so like. But like, I know the diabetic, but okay, so I explained the diabetic neuropathy, right? Okay. All right, so older adults, so it doesn't mean that because we get old, we have less sensation to pain, but because there are other chronic diseases, probably for that reason, we're not feeling the pain. Am I making sense? All right, so then, okay. So I'm gonna give you a break right now because like it's nine, 10 minutes, okay?